Hi, everyone. Thanks for tuning in for what I know will be an informative and enlightening presentation. I'm Mike Walther, the founder and president of Oak Wealth Advisors. We're a fiduciary financial services firm that has as our mission to educate and support families in the special needs community with our expertise and resources. Today, we are thrilled to be able to share the truly groundbreaking autism research from Dr. T.A. Meridian McDonald. She is the principal investigator of the Spectrum for Life Lab at Vanderbilt University Medical Center. In addition to being a leading autism researcher, she is also the loving mother of a son on the autism spectrum. I'm confident that we'll all be able to learn more about autism from Dr. McDonald. In order to allow Dr. McDonald to get her through her presentation, we're gonna allow a time at the end of her presentation for questions and answers. If you'd like to ask a question, please send it to me using the Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen. Because the presentation is being recorded to preserve anonymity of all attendees, I'll be asking the questions on your behalf. I'll do my best to get as many of the questions addressed by Dr. McDonald as we have time for tonight. If Dr. McDonald's presentation excites you enough to want to sponsor or support her future research efforts, she'll share information at the end of her presentation about how you can do just that. I know that your time is valuable, so I'm going to turn over the presentation to Dr. McDonald. Thank you for the warm welcome and thank you everyone for being here. Today, I'm going to discuss the broader autism phenotype constellations disability matrix paradigm, or what I call the BAPCO DMAP, or BAPCO for short, which is a unifying model to explain the nature and increased prevalence of autism based on six socially valued traits and, aut and childhood development. Science is still grappling with the big questions of autism, and these include what is autism? Why are autistic people so different from one another? You know, why is the prevalence changing? And these three questions, the way that we look for answers and the answers that we find have implications about what we should do about autism. This is a good time also for me to mention that research shows that the majority of adults on the autism spectrum prefer the term autistic. So I'll be using that term primarily throughout this presentation. I'm gonna talk about what we know about autism and then I'll trans, you know, transition to the BAPCO DMAP theory, which will connect with the current science, but will also move the science forward in a new direction. The prevalence of autism has increased dramatically over the years, from one in 5,000 in 1975, having an autism diagnosis, to one in 54 in 2020. The causes for these increases are unknown. However, Previous theories have attempted to explain the increases in autism. One idea is that the rate of autism has increased because the way we have diagnosed it has changed over time. And it certainly has changed over time. Without going into great detail, I'm going to review a brief timeline. Autism was first introduced in 1980 in the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual, the DSM, this is the resource used by psychiatrists and psychologists to diagnose individuals with developmental and psychiatric disorders that do not have a known biological cause. There were several subcategories under the umbrella term pervasive developmental disorder. Then, in order to improve the diagnostic descriptions, these subcategories were revised in 1987 to autistic disorder and pervasive developmental disorder not otherwise specified, which was a long way of saying similar to autistic disorder, but milder or a little different. In 1994, several more subcategories were added, including Asperger syndrome, which some of you may have heard of. In 2000, Rett's disorder was removed because the biological origin became known. And finally, in 2013, the umbrella term of pervasive developmental disorder and all of the subcategories were removed and replaced with the umbrella term autism spectrum disorder with three levels of support. I'll talk more about this last, def last definition later, but notice that the rates of autism have continued to climb well past 2013. So um, another theory about the prevalence increase involves diagnostic substitution. 
This is the idea that before autism was well known, individuals who would have met the criteria for autism as it is today um, would have received some other diagnosis back then, such as intellectual disability or what used to used to be called mental retardation. Um, or they might have received a diagnosis for um, specific language disability or a different developmental disability or maybe schizophrenia. Um, but in any case, um, we should see a matching decrease in the rate of autism with these, uh, um, with these other diagnostic groups. Sorry, we should, um, we should see a decrease in these other um, diagnostic groups while uh, the rate of autism would have increased. I, let me say that better. Um, and for a little while, that seemed to be the case with autism and intellectual disability. You know, as this snippet of a graph from California data seems to show, um, the rates of intellectual disability in the black line seem to be decreasing as the rates of uh, autism in the red were um, increasing until the lines seemed to meet. Um, however, uh, over time, we were able to get, you know, a, a view of the bigger picture. And we know that diagnostic substitution is not a good explanation for the increase in autism rates. The bigger picture, you know, from more data over time shows us that although the rates of intellectual disabilities does go up and down over time, it actually stays fairly constant. And when we gather data from a range of sources that use constant age mapping, that flat line um, becomes even more clear. In contrast, we can see that the rate of autism has steadily increased over time. Uh, and we see this pattern again in national uh, data where the rate of intellectual disabilities has gone up and down, um, but, but still stayed rather uh, uh, constants within a you know, relatively narrow range while the rate of autism has steadily increased. Um, and this means that the increases in autism prevalence are not well explained by changes in diagnostic criteria or by diagnostic substitution. Um, right now, there's no agreement regarding the mechanisms that underlie the increases in autism prevalence. Because this group is generally um, pretty familiar with the diagnosis of autism, I'm going to just briefly cover this information. Autism is currently defined as a person having issues in two major areas. The first involves persistent deficits, delays, and differences in social communication skills. And the second involves um, restricted repetitive patterns of behavior, interests, and activities. And the ways that these can present across individuals can look a lot of ways. Um, but I'd like to also bring your attention to the fact that the DSM and other diagnostic resources use deficit-based definitions. There are no positive characteristics included in the DSM or the ICD, which is the international resource, uh, for descriptions of autism. And I'd also like to bring your attention um, to the fact that the um, current definition of the broader autism phenotype in the research literature is simply milder symptoms of autism. Instead of subcategories used in the previous versions of the current DSM, or excuse me, in previous versions, the current DSM, excuse me, um, describes levels of support based on symptoms. So if a person presents with, you know, severe um, deficits or challenges in social communication or, or very limited social interactions, they would be described as needing level three support. Level two support would include someone with marked challenges and limited social interaction, while level one support describes someone who has, you know, noticeable challenges if they're not supported, and people with difficulty or um, perhaps decreased interest in engaging in social inter interactions. Similarly, level three support is needed for someone with extreme difficulty uh, coping with change, and the other levels describe individuals um, who are in need of less intense levels of support. So let me take a moment to talk about variation. Um, this great meme showed up in my LinkedIn feed this week, which I think does a great job of illustrating variation. Um, and I've taken some liberties with it. So the idea is this. Some people think the autism spectrum is like a single slider that runs from low functioning to high functioning, where people can be described as being on certain points of this slider. But in reality, 
it is more like having several sliders for different traits. Um, so, you know, a lot of sliders and each person has different settings. So think of, uh, think they might, one person might look like this um, and another person might actually look like this um, or, or like this. And so you get the idea. So the point is that there is a lot of variation across individuals on the autism spectrum. And in fact, accounting for this great variation is one of the biggest challenges um, that we have uh, in autism research. Stephen Shore, you know, a, a well-known autistic self-advocate is quoted as saying, if you have seen one person with autism, you've seen one person with autism. And that is because there is wide variation in the strengths and challenges that we see across autistic individuals. It's demonstrated in those three levels of support that I talked about. It's also demonstrated in the range of strengths that people on the autism spectrum display. Currently, there are, there's very little research on strengths in autism. But this idea between difference and disability is reflected in the labels, such as those with Asperger's syndrome versus autism, or high-functioning autism versus low-functioning autism. And what about scientists and engineers, artists, musicians, and others? Where is the line between difference and disability? Level zero and level one support. So one of the biggest challenges is in autism is explaining the heterogeneity, or which is just a fancy word for variation of traits in autism. And currently no prior theory adequately accounts for the wide spectrum of challenges and strengths in autism and what I'm going to talk about as Babco. I'm going to talk about autism and genetics for just two slides, um, just to provide you with some background. And then I'm going to talk about environmental factors. But first, most of the research on the genetics of autism is trying to figure out the cause of autism. You know, what causes people to have the characteristics present in autism? What we do know is that autism is a complex interaction between genes and environment. Autism is highly heritable. If one twin of an identical twin pair has an autism diagnosis, the likelihood that the other twin will meet criteria for autism is about 98%. The likelihood of, uh, um, of sharing an, an autism diagnosis drops to about 67% for fraternal twins and to 53% for the broader autism phenotype. Compare this, for example, with another condition, type 1 diabetes, where we know that both genes and environment interact. Yet you can see that type 1 diabetes is far less heritable than autism. Single genes, these are where uh, there's an individual gene that is highly predictive um, you know, of an autism diagnosis, and, and so many of those have been um, identified hundreds actually. And you'll see these um, in the news, you know, there are those flashy cause of autism identified news articles. And most of these uh, consist of spontaneous non-inherited gene mutations or rare inherited uh, in genes. And despite occupying much of the news, these account for only about 30% of autism cases. And most of these cases are associated with a low nonverbal IQ. But I want to emphasize the fact that no single genetic factor results in 100% of recipients having autism. For example, in Fragile X, a gene with, with the highest co-occurrence rates with autism, 60% of individuals from this population meet criteria for an autism diagnosis leaving 40% who do not. And what this means is that the genetic variants are highly predictive, but none are a definitive cause of autism. So I mentioned that the single genes account for about at best 30% of the variants in autism. However, the vast majority of autism heritability comes through common genetic variants. And these are these single nucleotide polymorphisms. Um, these are the genes that account for most of the genetic variants in people. So 
everything. Um, your eye color, your hair color, your height, your, your regulatory genes, your metabolic system. It's, it's pretty much everything. And there are a large number of these SNPs that predict autism um, uh, or occur at a higher rate in autism. But each of these have small effect sizes. Individually, they're not strong predictors of autism. But these SMPs can cluster or occur together. And these clusters collectively become stronger predictors of autism. It's a growing field. And right now, it's unclear how these clusters work or what these nexes really mean. Some of these SMPs code for things like copper sensitivity. But the majority, we don't, we don't really know what they're coding for or how they're operating together in relation to autism. But there's an odd thing that has shown up with this type of research, which is that the polygenic uh, risk score or the clusters of genes associated with autism for those who do not have a co-occurring intellectual disability, which, the, which is this, the majority of individuals on the spectrum, um, is associated with higher parental attainment and IQ. And this is very odd because it runs opposite from that of other disorders. Most other neurodevelopmental disorders decrease with socioeconomic status. Sociologically, this has been explained as evidence of social capital. You know, the idea that people who have greater social attainment have more social or um, financial resources to get a diagnosis. But while that can be the, definitely can be the case, um, it, we shouldn't see a relationship genetically. Um, in other words, um, people who have uh, fewer, um, you know, uh, social capital, you know, fewer financial resources or social resources are not genetically, you know, different than people who have greater financial resources. And so in general, there's no difference genetically, but we do see an association in autism with um, higher socioeconomic status genetically, and that is unusual. Uh, in addition to genetic factors, there are a mountain of environmental factors associated with autism, and these run a gamut, which I will talk more about later. But these include maternal and paternal factors, health and nutrition, environmental toxins and pathogens, um, illness and prenatal and postnatal trauma and other factors. But I want to emphasize that the twin studies demonstrate the genetic link is stronger than the environmental link. That said, environmental factors may still contribute to individual genetic vulnerability and development in autism. This is very important. I'm going to talk a lot more about this later. So a large portion of my work focuses on reconceptualizing the broader autism phenotype. The rest of this presentation is going to focus on what I call the broader autism phenotype constellations or BAPCO. As you'll recall, um, the broader autism phenotype and autism were defined by specific disabilities related to social interaction, communication, and unusual behavior. Instead, I'm going to shift our attention to socially valued traits that I propose underlie autism and actually underlie those other characteristics that were described in the DSM. So these are socially valued traits such as sustained attention, increased memory, systemizing, object orientation, non-conformity, um, and sensory differences. And these are all considered non-disabling traits. Many of these are considered beneficial traits, but I'm going to describe ways that these traits individually or in combination um, through extreme expression or through constellations can interfere with development uh, and you know, developmental timing and can also interact with the developmental timing of co-occurring disabilities. And these traits, these six traits exist in varying levels across cultures. Um, and the parameters of these traits in a population are influenced by things like genetics. So the traits of parents and of course, um, genetic mutations, um, the environment, which consists of opportunities and risks for the individual. And the, um, the environment also includes the cultural values and rules within a society. 
And all of these together influence and are influenced by non-random mating, such as choosing mates based on similar or dissimilar traits and other criteria. And yes, I'm talking about parents here. Um, so for this talk, I'm going to focus on assertative mating and these BAPCO traits. Assertative mating is simply where members choose mates with similar traits. Um, we might choose someone who looks like us, or maybe somebody who acts like us, or somebody who's interested in the same things that we are. And this requires that the traits are detectable. When people engage in assertative mating, it can change the frequency that traits are represented in a population, such as from one in 5,000, you know, to one in 54. Um, it can increase the rate of change in the frequency of the traits in the population, such as the rapid increase that we've seen in autism. And it can change the intensity of the traits. Uh, and not just physical traits such as height, you know, like you see in these poodles here, but it can also um, uh, change the intensity of traits of personality. So think of the difference in personality between, say, like a chihuahua and a border collie. Um, excuse me, I need to get a sip of water. And so cultural environments can also affect the traits that we detect by increasing or decreasing the value of certain traits. You know, our traits, our culture um, affects how, uh, how attractive we think that certain traits are. You know, um, in the West, you know, in, in, in individualistic cult cultures, we have a certain sets of traits that we particularly value. Um, and cultural environments, you know, also affect people's ability or freedom to select traits that are based on, um, select mates that are based on traits, you know. But as an aside, even, even planned marriages that have matchmakers can contribute to a sort of mating if they're pairing people based on a similarity of traits. So I'm going to talk about social factors. Um, so specifically about how education and employment um, have shaped our mate selection for BABCO traits, these positive traits in the United States. All right, so this is the model for my theoretical paradigm and it is a lot to take in all at once. So we're gonna go through this in very small chunks. So starting with the historic education and occupational opportunities for males and females, I'm going to talk about assertative mating um, and mate selection and how that can lead to BAPCO personalities. So there have been some really radical changes in our education systems over the last 100 years. Over 100 years ago, compulsory education was not universal in the United States for elementary school. Most people did not have access to school. In fact, access to high school was not universally available until the mid 1940s. There's also been a shift away from social promotion where people are promoted from grade to grade for social reasons such as age or, 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 or as in a group, as a cohort in favor of something called merit promotion which is where grade promotion is dependent on demonstrated competencies. You know, say reading and math skills, for example. In this way, Schools, you know, starting all the way from elementary school all the way through high school, um, have begun uh, have, have begun sorting people based on specific skills relating to memory, attention, systemizing, and object orienting, and some other skills. So think reading, uh, math, science, and and other types of skills. And when I say select here. I mean that, that these, these traits become more detectable due to the social values that are related to education attainment. And the introduction of private schools, magnet schools, and other education practices are sorting people even more based on characteristics. We've also had extraordinary changes in our employment opportunity since the US became a country. There has been increased freedom to choose one's occupation, career, or level of education attainment. 
And these are due to, you know, fewer limits uh, related to social class and parental occupations. Um, and at this point, you know, the son of a shoemaker is not destined to become a shoemaker. Um, individuals, you know, uh, and particularly for a longer period of time, men have been able to choose from a widening range of occupations and specializations. The choice of one's career or occupation is a strong signal of traits. It can signal one's abilities and preferences. And in this way, the traits of engineers may be quite different than the traits of entertainers. And the traits of someone who's successful at data entry may be quite different from someone who excels at waiting tables or bartending. And these occupations and preferences influence where we work and live, the hobbies and recreational activities we choose, our social communities, and our partners for offspring. And these influences affect who meets whom and creates genetic subgroups. Babco is likely one of many subgroups. Women, on the other hand, have only more recently experienced freedoms related to occupation and career. In the not so distant past, women were expected to marry and perform domestic services in the home. Their employment opportunities were also restricted to domestic services such as tailoring and caring for children. This meant that women could choose from many salient traits in men but men can only choose from a small number of detectable traits in women. You know, how does she look? Um, does she cook well? Uh, you know, is she good with children? So here's a graph from the US Department of Labor showing women's participation in the labor force from 1950 to 2016. And note that this graph bears resemblance to the increases that we see in autism. But more important, than labor participation. Um, women experience an increase in their freedom to choose their occupations, careers, and education attainment. Between 1950 and 1980, women viewed employment as secondary to their domestic duties. But starting in the eight, 1980s, women increasingly began to choose careers and other types of social freedoms. Uh, and these changes increase the number of traits that men could detect in women. And this dual-sided mate selection on specific traits can in result in dramatic increases in the frequency and intensity of those traits in a population. And even though people have gained greater freedom in education and occupation, they were at least limited by who they came in contact with. But in this fast paced technological age, we have taken assertive mating to the next level with dating apps that bring you in contact with people you might otherwise have never met. And you can pick people based on common interests, or if that wasn't enough, you can check on computer algorithms that will tell you how close of a match you are with someone else, right? And this will likely have an incredible impact on our offspring. So when men and women, or more specifically here, because we're talking about offspring, males and females are meeting each other based on these socially valued traits that are being selected for by education and occupational abilities and, and other preferences. You know, I'm talking about these very specific traits. It can lead to offspring that have a range of these traits. Um, they may have all of these traits, or they may have specific constellations of these traits. They may have offspring with greater intensity of one or more of these traits. And these intense traits and specific constellations may have different effects on development. All right. So I've talked about the historic factors that were relating to you know, occupation and education for men and women and how that relates to assertive mating, which can lead to offspring with BAPCO personalities. Now I'd like to walk us through the top part of this model. So I'm gonna talk about how these BAPCO traits, when intensified, can affect development in ways that may lead to autism.
So let's talk about Babco traits and child development. I'm going to start with sensation and perception because all attention is filtered through the sense and perceptual systems. Children with strong Babco personalities may have greater preferences for attending to sensory and perceptual information. They may have heightened or dampened awareness. You know, these are traits that we see in super tasters who can detect ingredients in food or others that require a lot of sensation for it to register. They may have unusual sensory experience, uh, experiences. For example, there are some people who see color when they hear sound. Others have unusual, um, unusually high um, you know, um, or low pain thresholds. And these differences in moderate or heightened forms are not necessarily disabling. However, they can become a disability if a person is unable to shift attention away from sensory or other cognitive abilities or, or other types of uh, uh, information. This inability can be due to preferences. It can be due to the volume of information, unusual perception, or pain. I'm going to talk about attention and memory together, but they're considered separate domains. Sustained attention or the ability to focus attention for long periods of time is a socially valued trait that helps people better understand their social and their non-social environments. Um, clearly being unable to sustain attention would be disabling, but the inability to shift attention can also be disabling. Increased memory helps people learn from their environment and actions. We can all agree that decreased memory can hamper learning, but what about increased memory? I proposed that increased memory and attention when they go outside of certain parameters can disrupt developmental timing and act synergistically, act together in, in development. I'm gonna use language development as an example. So infants are geniuses when it comes to learning language. They don't really you know, need a lot of direct instruction to learn it. They kind of learn it on their own. But in order to do this, infants need constraints on memory and attention to learn language. It helps them identify phonemes, which are the smallest parts of language. And Jenny Safran's you know, work uses the example, pretty baby. And so if somebody says, oh, what a pretty baby, there are no pauses between these words. In fact, it can be very difficult to know how to parse where one word begins or ends. Oops, let me go back there, jumping too much at a time. But infants perform probabilistic learning to determine what sounds go together to form words. They're figuring out the likelihood that certain sounds combine to form specific words. So for example, in English, we have a lot of E sounds at the end of words. We can say pretty, baby, doggy, kitty, and, and we don't have many ba sounds at the end of words. So no pre-ba or t-ba, right? Um, so ba sounds are not common at the end of words in English. And babies use these probabilities to figure out which sounds form words. And it relies on some very interesting constraints. It's relying on the fact that these infants have very tiny attention spans and very limited memories. And it's allowing them to focus all of their attention on these small segments to be able to perform this probabilistic learning. And adult brains just can't do this. Our attention and memory are too large. We can learn huge chunks of information, but we're not able to break it down into very fine grain, high resolution probabilities like infants are doing. So I can learn this phrase. I, um, I, uh, I can say, um, sono contente, diverte conosutro, which is one of very few phrases I know in Italian. And the little I know, I speak badly. Um, but I know that phrase means, it's nice to meet you. I can use that whole sentence, mm, but I don't really know how to use those words flexibly. I can change one word in it. I know I can say, sono contente, diverte telefonato. 
And the first one means it's nice to meet you. And the second one means I'm glad you called. So I'm able to chunk these large bits of information, but I'll never be able to parse the Italian language down and to fine grain resolution like an infant. So I will never speak Italian like a native speaker. And infants with increased memory and attention do not even have the previous experience with a language to inform how to use the language. And so what we may see in some individuals with autism, those who have increased memory and attention, is this echolalia, or speaking in full sentences without seeming to understand them. Because of the physical development it takes to say these whole chunks, these infants may not talk for a long time. And by the time the infants develop the physical capacity, um, they're speaking in these whole phrases that they appear not to understand. So you say, do you want a cookie? And the child responds, do you want a cookie? And we call that echolalia and pronoun reversal. And we call it a lot of things, but it could just simply be that the child is babbling in these whole phrases, trying to figure out what it means. And so, you know, we see these behaviors of children, what I would describe as sense-making behaviors, where, for example, a child is memorizing whole movies, you know, line by line. Um, you know, it speaks to this intense attention and memory. But these children do not have the previous experiences they need to be able to break this down on their own, to be able to break it into smaller components, um, to make it easier to learn the content and the meaning of those words. So this is a famous vase, uh, it's, it's a Rubin vase illusion. And it's a, it's a good way of illustrating selective attention. So, you know, I'm talking about these different traits and some people, some people on the spectrum will have some traits, some will have others. But when you're looking at this vase, I want you to pay attention to how you can see the vase in the black or you can see the two faces in the white space, but you can't attend to both of them at the same time. You have to switch your attention. You can kind of vaguely almost neither see both, but you can't truly see both at the same time. Um, all people are observing their environment, both their social environment and their non-social environment. But when most young children interact with their environment, they prioritize social information. And social information is very important for learning from others. Attending to social information is crucial for learning language, communication, and social interactions. And it is a foundational skill for learning imitation. But children with BAPCO personalities often prefer non-social information in a way they're looking at the vase and not the two faces. These are kids who are flipping the light switches on and off, trying to peer inside of the, you know, the wheel hub of the uh, matchbox cars, you know, or they're engaging in arts and sciences um, and often doing activities more often on their own. Non-social information helps us learn how the non-social world operates. Preferences for non-social information likely underlie our motivation for the arts, sciences, our innovations and in tool use and, and so much more. But having an extreme personality that attends exclusively to the social or the object environment would be disabling. So there's not a ton of research on nonconformity, and I, I think I, I find this actually quite surprising. But conformity drives our natural motivation to imitate. It's the social glue that holds civilizations together. Conformity facilitates the creation of social identities. It can help us reduce conflict. And the desire to conform and possibly the desire to please others, which might be linked to conformity, drives our desire to imitate a foundational skill for social learning. But nonconformity has social value and that it drives our ability to innovate. It likely underlies our um, desire to explore, our ability to create social changes, our technological and art artistic innovations, and our ability to lead. 
and individualistic cultures, nonconformity can signal status and competence, but it has the opposite effect in collectivist cultures. And nonconformity is discouraged in tight cultures. Loose cultures like the US tolerate and even celebrate nonconformity. Again, extreme personalities that exclusively conform or non-conform would be disabling. But in some cases, a disability might simply be having a high mismatch of preferences in relation to one's culture. Systemizing really comes from the work of Dr. Simon Baron Cohen, a prominent autism scientist. He has a new book out called Pattern Seekers, and he has done a tremendous job of highlighting how this attribute can operate in autism. And he talks about how this attribute is, a found, you know, is foundational for the creation of human civilization. He and I describe systemizing quite a bit differently, um, and that's a talk for a different day. But um, it can be hard for people to imagine what non-systemizing might look like. Um, I propose that non-systemizing is simply in the moment action and reaction, and people do this socially and non-socially all the time. But an easy example might be laughing automatically at something without thinking about it. You see something and it just tickles your funny bone. Systemizing, on the other hand, involves how we organize information and in our world. It relies on questions like what and why. Um, where, when, all of our, all of our question, our questioning words and our questions that we ask. Um, so you might imagine um, laughing at something automatically, but then wondering, why is that funny? Systemizing then underlies our conscious rules relating to social and non-social environments, our laws, our sciences, our arts, and so much more. Um, behaviors relating to systemizing may also underlie anxiety and other conditions. Anxious thinking involves risk assessment and planning. Rumination may simply be a long string of why did that happen that way? And systemizing may also under, underlie a need to re-examine fine details over and over, which we see in some other disabilities. And then obviously, low systemizing would result in great difficulty with learning and understanding concepts. So I'm describing how Babco traits can relate to development. You can have these different constellations of traits, but as you increase the intensity or the clustering of combinations of any of these traits, we may get different combinations that create different developmental pathways. And these preferences may affect development early. So the more attention spent on non-social information means less time spent learning social information. And the more time spent non-conforming means less time imitating. So I've talked about how the education and occupational opportunities for men and women can lead to um, assertive mating, which can in turn lead to BAPCO personalities and how extreme traits or certain trait clusters may result in autism. Um, so now I'd like to walk us through the lower half of this model. Specifically, I'd like to talk about how Babco personalities can interact with another disability or co-occur with this other disability to result in autism. Take a sip here. And this brings me to what I call the Babco Disability Matrix Paradigm. So autism is associated with a huge range of risk factors that include prenatal risk factors, you know, perinatal risk factors, and postnatal risk factors. And all of these factors are related to other disabilities, you know, not, not just autism, but, but a wide range of other disabilities. Um, different risk factors may create specific challenges for development. And I'm not going to talk about all of these factors, but the main takeaway here is to notice the sheer number of risk factors associated with autism. 
Similarly, autism is associated with an increased risk of co-occurring conditions, such as developmental disabilities, genetic syndromes, mental health conditions, physical health conditions. In fact, only 15% of eight-year-olds with autism have no identified co-occurring condition. Yet, that leaves 85% of autistic children and adults with at least one co-occurring condition. And each of these conditions and combinations of conditions may create different developmental pathways. So a person might ask themselves, what's going on with autism? Why are there so many co-occurring conditions? You know, genetic, neurological, developmental, mental health, physical health. Why is autism more common with factors related to developmental disabilities? Well, I'm going to turn this question around by asking, what if the presence of risk factors and co-occurring conditions simply interact with a BAFCO personality? So this brings us to the BAPCO disability matrix paradigm or the BAPCO DMAP. On the left side, describing the rows is the disability category without and with a co-occurring co -occurring disability. At the top, describing the columns is the degree of BAPCO traits, low and high. I'm proposing that if an individual doesn't have an intellectual disability, they're just people you know, they have a low or high BAPCO traits. And both of these groups are just regular people with different BAPCO constellations. You know, maybe a low BAPCO person might be very social, very charming, and a high BAPCO person might be more interested in the way things work and less interested in people, but they wouldn't be considered having a disability. However, if a person with a co-occurring disability has a low BAPCO personality, we would just refer to that, uh, to them, we would describe them as having that disability. We would say, you know, Johnny has fragile X or Jose has an, in, you know, information processing disability. But if an individual has a disability and a high BAPCO personality, we just lump all that together and we call that autism. And so what I'm proposing is that autism is a combination of these socially valued traits, all of these constellations of BAPCO personality combined with a huge range of co-occurring conditions. And so we have this huge pathway, um, you know, variety of pathways that a person can go down to receive a diagnosis of autism, which, you know, explains those levels of support that we were talking about earlier. And it certainly explains the huge variation that we see in autism. And so I call this a Schrodinger of a diagnosis because autism simultaneously is and is not a thing. Uh, and, you know, science, it keeps treating autism, treating it as a single thing. But it actually is many, many things. There's, there's these different constellations, personalities, co-occurring conditions. It has many pathways um, and with, with different, you know, pathways of risk and different pathways of development. Um, and so at this point, I've covered the whole model. You know, how the education and oppor uh, um, occupational opportunities for males and females create opportunities for assertive mating that can lead to BAPCO personalities. I've described how offspring can have extreme BAPCO um, traits or, or constellations that result in autism. And I've described how BAPCO personalities can combine with co-occurring disabilities uh, in a combination um, that we call autism. So in this presentation, I've addressed the big questions in autism. You know, what is autism? Well, autism is extreme BAPCO traits or BAPCO with a co-occurring disability. Why is there so much variation on the autism spectrum? Why is it so heterogeneous? BAPCO describes a constellation of traits and BAPCO can occur with a um, huge range of disabilities. Why is the prevalence increasing? 
No, we're, we have experienced and are experiencing historic changes in education and occupation and other environments, such as those dating apps, which are creating environments for assertive mating, which has led to subpopulations. And, you know, BAPCO is probably just one of many subpopulations. And this brings us to the big question, what should we do about autism? Well, first, I just want to mention that this is a testable theory. You know, one hypothesis is that multiplex families, that is families that have multiple members um, on the autism spectrum, you know, they should have a greater representation of Babco constellations. And they may also have more disabilities that co-occur with autism. And then you know, in different, uh, in different uh, levels here, orthodox and traditional societies that place less value on innovation, um, on nonconformity or meritorious activities, we would expect to have uh, very low rates of BAPCO and autism. Societies that value BAPCO traits for males, but not females, should have an intermediate representation of BAPCO and autism. And societies that value BAPCO for males and females should have the highest representation of BAPCO and autism. So one of the things that we need is to create a measure of BAPCO. Um, we need to shift our science to include a combination of beneficial and detrimental traits. If we expand our understanding of autism to be more holistic, then we have a more complete and accurate descriptions that can lead to better research. This theory also has implications relating to research investigating the cause, cure, and prevention of autism. It may alter how we research causes. There may be, need to be more emphasis on co-occurring conditions. Um, you know, our prevention and cure and treatment of those co-occurring conditions. Autism, um, excuse me, Babco as a personality um, cannot be cured and likely cannot be prevented because ethics. Um, and, the, you know, the prevalence, though, could change if we had extreme changes in our social values and in our um, social environments. Um, but then we'd have to ask ourselves, you know, um, and we do have to ask ourselves, what do we do about um, individuals with extreme BAPCO personalities? Well, and as far as personalities go, any personality trait that is unchecked is a disorder. So, you know, what do we do about individuals who have great difficulty in being able to rein in certain aspects of their personality or their psychological processes? But in order to really understand what we're seeing in autism, you know, or, or um really understand what's going on in children, we need to, more emphasis on BAPCO profiles and a better understanding of developmental pathways. We don't know what, what typical development is in autism exactly. We know that we want to go in and intervene, and, and I'm not arguing against intervention, um, but we don't really know what the natural timing is for individuals on the autism spectrum. It's possible that some individuals with autism may be able to shift from autism to BAPCO, depending on the degree to which their co-occurring disabilities can be addressed, or the degree to which an individual may be able to grow into self-regulation skills to be able to rein in certain aspects of their personality. You know, to go from the different levels of support or different levels of disability to potentially a level zero of support, where one has a um, socially valid um, but very different way of being, um, but not necessarily a disabling. Um, but even if a person didn't have a disability, even if they're not technically autistic, we may be categorizing some folks who have regular old Babco personality as autism, simply because they are facing intolerance and discrimination. And there are also people that do not meet the criteria for autism who are also experiencing poor outcomes relating to their, you know, their low preference for social activities and behaviors, or their tendencies to engage in nonconformity or, or a number of other traits. It's also possible that the social value of their traits, you know, are not being emphasized enough preventing optimal outcomes. And 
facing intolerance and discrimination, we know that we have people, and particularly um, girls and women, who are engaging in camouflaging. And right now, um, research relating to the um, long-term effects of camouflaging, psychological and potentially um, physical health, you know, are, it's being researched now, but um, we don't yet know what kind of effects that, that can have. Um, but I've talked a lot about children, and many of you may have adolescents or an adult child, uh, adult children. This is my last slide. Um, so it may be useful to think about how specific combinations of BAFCO traits may drive behavior. And so here I'm combining systemizing uh, with a number of other traits. So if a person is high systemizing and high non-conforming, this person likely needs to be convinced. They're not going to just do what everyone else is doing um, just because everyone else is doing it or follow a rule just because it's a rule. They need to be convinced that it's a good idea. In contrast, uh, a person who's, you know, uh, you know uh, in this Babco profile who has high systemizing but tends to be more conforming um, may be an intense rule follower. And such a person may also have high levels of anxiety, you know, wanting very much to fit in with other people. Someone who is a high systemizer and who's highly socially oriented would likely be very socially and emotionally adept. But timing matters. Autistic children can be intensely object oriented, but switch to being intensely socially oriented, sometimes starting around puberty or later. But these, uh, you know, these individuals may cover a lot of ground. Um, catching up socially, but they will likely never be as socially fluid as someone who was socially oriented since infancy. Someone else who, you know, may be a high systemizer and who has high object orientation, well, these are our creators, they're our experts, and they, um, you know, they might even be our, you know, engineers or our athletes who, who may prefer solitary supports and and they they may struggle in social areas but they may may actually do well in a lot of other areas and we could walk through a huge range of combinations of all those other traits in the same way obviously um, if less attention is spent on social observation interaction and imitation a person will have less um, social skills you know their, their social skills will be less fluid however if the same person is well supported they can have um, accelerated or even elevated skills in non-social areas. Um, we need to um, also accommodate co-occurring conditions with at least 85% of autistic individuals having one or more co-occurring condition. These individuals face challenging health disparities that require better services and support, improved healthcare access and, and health related funding research. And there's very little of it right now. Um, and this brings me uh, finally to the importance of self-determination, um, which, which also relates to things like self-advocacy. Um, many um, autistic individuals have spent their life focusing on autisms, uh, you know, all the ways that they ought to be, and have had less opportunity figuring out self-leadership. You know, for parents um, listening in, I want to clarify that self-determination is not necessarily, you know, the same thing as um, self-sufficiency. Um, I'm really uh, referring to, um, you know, focusing in on what a person wants for themselves in the short or long term and engaging in actions that create that future for themselves. Um, Self-determination is intrinsically motivating and people can develop uh, important skills in one area that at some point they can apply to other areas of their lives. Um, so this brings me uh, to the end of my presentation. Um, let's see. Um, I want to just conclude this presentation. I'd like to thank um, Mike Walther for inviting me to present on this topic. I have worked on this theory for over 25 years, and I am grateful for the funding support I've received, as well as the critical guidance I've received from mentors and colleagues over the years. Um, and so now uh, I'd like, I'd, I would welcome uh, your questions. Thank you. Dr. McDonald, thank you so much for your time tonight and for sharing your research and your life's efforts to really learn more about autism with all of us who are living in the community and trying to grasp it as best we can. It's a lot to take in. 
In fact, I'll actually lead with a comment that wasn't even actually a question, but it, I think kind of summarizes where I am with this as well, which is, I don't have a question. I just want to say this is Nobel Prize winning stuff. Amazing. Thank you. Um, thank you very much. I'm, I'm, I'm hoping that this will have an impact and, and will um, shift how we are um, approaching this topic. I think that's true for all of us. Um, will the slides be available? I know that your slides are somewhat developmental and they keep building on each other. Will there be some ability for the folks in addition to seeing the recording to get it, access to the slides or not? Um, yes, as a matter of fact, um, my slides, if you notice, have multiple animations on them. It'll take me time to separate them out so they'll make more sense. Um, there's quite a bit of slides. Um, so I think there's about 50 slides or more in here, but I can make a PDF of them available. Wonderful. Thank you for that. All right. So for the questions, um, does your theory drive changes in treatment options? I believe that it can. Um, I think that the future of autism isn't to decide whether or not a person has autism. I think the future is to be able to sit down with each individual child and go, okay, these are the areas that the child is struggling in. So those ranges of, of potential disabilities, you know, which we know at first, on first glance is going to be things like um, it's going to be things like, you know, language and communication, socialization, because that's why we think there's autism. But it's also the potential, now that we know that many of them have co-occurring conditions, it means we have to scratch the surface a little further, find out how to support those, and then also identify these positive traits. Right now, um, children on the autism spectrum, when they're identified, they're receiving, you know, the recommendation is 25 to 40 hours of intervention. That's a lot of time working on things that are really, really hard. And what they're not getting is something that typical kids are getting, which uh, is often early childhood development, which is here are things you like doing, things you feel like you're good at. Let's see yeah. how far. Let's, let's see how hold you. Hold you. And we're not really doing that with kids on the spectrum. But we but design toys. toys. Is there an echo? There an echo? And you're not hearing an echo? You're not hearing an echo. Um, so we design toys for typical kids that meet their development. Imagine if we were able to design toys for children with um, Babco traits. So, you know, you have a child that's flipping a light switch on and off, um, you know, which is a fascinating thing. It turns the light on. And I always imagine if Newton was seeing a light switch going on and off like that, right? Like he doesn't know anything about wiring. He's going to look just like a child with autism. But imagine if we could create toys that allow children who are interested in that sort of thing to really explore, you know, sciences or explore arts um, or explore other types of things at an, uh, uh, at an early age, they can be nonverbal. We might be actually creating um, specialists and, um, and, you know, a person's not going to become um, a person's not going to become successful by working on their weaknesses only. A person becomes successful by working on their strengths. Awesome. Another question for you. Would part of the correlation between women increasing their level of employment and autism diagnosis increasing be attributed to the increased information regarding the disorder? I'm... I'm a little confused by the question. Could you break that down for me a little bit? I think I am too. Um, I think the question's asking, do we just have two co-occurring events where women's greater level of employment opportunity happens to be co-occurring with a rise right. in people identifying the disorder? Or Absolutely. That for people. You know, are we looking at just correlation? <clears throat> you know, correlation is not causation. It doesn't mean that these right. two things are related. And that's absolutely a, a very important question. Um, that's why we need to create a Babco measure. I've been in uh, some conversations with um, different uh, researchers. John, uh, Dr. John Constantino is a is a well known. Um, geneticist, um, an autism researcher. He, uh, he is the uh, creator of the social rating scale. Um, 
And, you know, we've been in conversations about using these two measures together um, with uh, the twin and multiplex families so that we can actually test that theory, right? So the, the idea would be um, whether or not it's related to women's careers or not, are we actually seeing that these traits are tracking uh, genetic families? And we can also test the... Um, we can also test this idea about women's employment if we look across societies. But there's, a, there's also a, a, a confound with that, and that is that in many of the societies um, that we might be looking at that where um, men or women might have less freedoms for employment, there may also be greater stigma for things like autism. And so that's one of the challenges is being able, how do we go in and accurately assess for autism uh, and, and also be able to look at these types of relationships. Okay, <clears throat> I've got time for a couple more here. We've got, hang on, I'm pulling over from the chat. <clears throat> Have you developed a high, 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 low, low, low for each combination of traits and then treatment options that would apply to each segmentation of that? Right. And also combinations. So I talked about how memory and attention can combine. And in that last slide, I was talking about how, um, you know, you can have these um, like uh, systemizing and nonconformity or systemizing and, you know, high and low conformity can look really different. Um, and that's probably true these other combinations. And we really need to look at wh what combinations might matter most. Um, I also have other work that's on identity, where I look at individuals who view being on the autism spectrum as a positive difference versus a challenging disability, or view the characteristics of autism as being changeable or not. And I found that combinations of those two really mattered, that individuals that believe that it was a positive difference um, that was also changeable had the best outcomes the people that were very low on both of those, they thought it was a challenging disability that couldn't be changed, had the um, most challenging outcomes. And then the, the folks that sort of had a mix of those who had intermediate outcomes. It appears that positive difference seems to have a more of a um, impact on psychological health and changeability seems to have more of an impact on um, attainment. So education attainment, um, it seems to be more performance related and employment and that sort of thing. So, so those high, high, low, low, that sort of thing, it's, it's a, that's definitely the right direction. Okay, the next question is a little bit more specific to one set of circumstances, but it may talk about where future research is heading. So I'll try to get through this for you. Question is, or actually more of a comment followed by a question. In my son's condition, he's got gifts and gaps. For example, he can breach your firewall, but he can't dress himself. His attention span is long for certain activities and his narrow range of giftedness, but he cannot dress himself independently. So the biggest challenge they have is trying to teach the nonverbal, highly intelligent child motivation to do the things that he's not interested in doing. So if he doesn't have a demonstrated interest in learning, is there any evidence you've found on ways to increase interest for the things where there may be deficits? So one of the things that... Um one of the things that I, one of the areas of research that I'm particularly interested in is social and emotional development and autism. I am suspecting that social and emotional um, development um, is both biological and environmental. I think some folks may be delayed the way, um, the way, in, um, you know, uh, intelligence can be delayed, you know, cognitive development can be delayed. Um, but I think in some cases it's delayed because there's fewer experiences. But social and emotional delays are really um, important to pay attention to. Um, you can kind of look at, I, I sometimes talk to parents and say, essentially, when you draw up your whole list of quote unquote complaints, you can often find them on a developmental map of ages, right? So you draw them up and you go, oh, this looks like this would fit at six or this fits at, you know, 14. And it can be a really great gap between the person's calendar age and their social and emotional age. And it's good. I think it's good to do this because if you can take a look at where they're at, you also know where to set your expectations. And that's tricky because if you're looking at somebody who's really smart in certain areas, but their social and emotional development is really delayed, it's easy to have this sort of uh, unclear understanding of where to put your expectations. 
right? Somewhere in this place. But really, you go to the social and emotional place. That lets you know what expectations to have of that person. It also shows where they're, um, they're, they tend to be emotionally ready. Um, so I meet folks all the time who are on the autism spectrum who might be, you might call them two-thirds their age socially and emotionally. Um, so that would mean that at age 18, when we're expecting them to go off to college or, or go live on their own, they might be socially and emotionally age 12. And so we're looking at that individual and we're like, you know, you're still playing with toys. You're still, you're still, you're talking to yourself in the shower, you know, which some people is, is talking about like psychosis. Some of these adults, um, get diagnosed with, with um, certain kinds of diagnoses when actually the behavior is more fitting for a younger age. Um, and these individuals, you know, they're not thinking, they don't want to go get a job full time. What 12 year old does? Um, and so when you start thinking about where they are there, now the big question is, can they be accelerated? Um, in some cases, if it's biologically driven, probably not. That would be try, trying to accelerate puberty. Um, uh, in other cases, it may simply be that if you engage in, um, you know, certain types of activities, uh, that person can develop faster. A question that I have is we know that um, when young people are kind of forced to live on their own early, they do mature early. But that, that acceleration um, may be coupled with trauma. And so there's a, there's a question that I have as to, you know, where, what is that optimal um, place of support? that um, helps a person um, really um, optimize their potential, um, but not really pushing them beyond what, what's healthy for them. We don't know that yet. Um, but until we look at development and developmental timing as sort of a naturally uh, occurring process across autisms, um, we won't know the answer to that yet. Um, to build on that, <clears throat> would it be safe to say that your expectation is that if you meet the child where they are on the social, sorry, social emotional level age wise, that there's always going to be a continuum for learning that they may never completely catch up, but you should never expect them to stop at some level and give up? I, I, I believe that's exactly correct. And I was talking to someone um, who was on the, I, I, I'd given, I was co-teaching um, uh, a self-determination program with someone who was on the spectrum. And this is, this is a person that's now, um, a, you know, a well-respected member of the autism community and a leader in it. And we were talking, um, I, I was talking about how two folks on the spectrum, about how social and emotional development can be really at these different points. And he came and talked to me at a different time. And he said, wow, this is very interesting. Um, he said, you know, I'm, you know, past my 40s, I'm past my 50s, you know, and I realize now that I did the math, tick, 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 and I think I'm two-thirds my age socially and emotionally, which means I'm 30. And he said, and I, I find that really depressing. And I said, don't. I said, if you, if you think about it in a different way, you have all the experiences of a 50-year-old except that you're going at everything that you're doing with the passion that's normally seen for someone who's age 30. And that makes you very unique and very, very valuable. And all of the people in the community that you're in that are looking up to you for all the things you're doing, it, it, it speaks to that. And somebody else who was at a different stage, they might be at your stage and thinking of retirement, but you're not thinking that. He goes, no, you know, goodness, no, that's the last thing I want. You know, he goes, I have so much to give. And I said, you have like the sense of drive and purpose that you would see of somebody who's 20 years younger than you. And that's incredibly valuable. Thank you for that. So another question, I'm not quite sure I'm going to build a phrase it correctly, but I'll give you a shot to try and answer it anyway. So if a child has a disability identified perhaps as being autistic, is there a way for the parent to identify what co-occurring conditions might be there in addition to the BAPCO traits? Right. That's a great question. So um, one of the things that you want to think about um, are just um, going down kind of the range of things that we would normally consider specific language disabilities, right? Or specific uh, learning disabilities, is what I meant to say. So um, an individual might, who's on the spectrum might actually be really great at reading, but really struggle at math. Um, so you're really wanting to kind of look at, you know, just the kinds of things you would if the child was typical and you're looking across developmental disabilities. 
Um, there's new research showing that adults on the autism spectrum are at greater risk for every major chronic condition. Um, health condition. So it's one of those things you want to be thinking about, you know, is this, is this individual experiencing pain? Are they having health conditions? And, and you, since we know that there's a higher likelihood, it kind of makes sense to, to kind of look, um, be on the outlook, you know, on the, on the lookout for it. Uh, at eight, by eight years old, 85% of folks who, are, who were diagnosed as being on the spectrum had some type of co-occurring condition. So you want to just be looking at it. And some of those co-occurring conditions may mean that the individual has more fatigue. And if you have more fatigue, you have less energy for other kinds of things. And so you can see I'm, I'm devoting part of my time and energy to the things I enjoy. So this non-social information or the sensory information, and I have this fatigue. And so my window of things for social or, um, um, you know, communication things get smaller and smaller that, that I'm motivated to put energy to because I don't have as much, much resources left over. So it's something you want to look at and, and, and try to find ways to support. The more you can ease that fatigue, the more, you know, the increased nutrition, um, physical health, um, the, the, the better off that individual is going to be. Thank you for that. So looking forward out 20, 25 years, this is my question. So I'll take responsibility if you don't like it. Assuming you have societies that are currently more closed that become more open, create more middle class, more opportunities, more rights for all people, would it be logical to then assume that we're going to have more incidents of autism diagnosis and therefore a greater need for research in the area? All right. So that's a, it's a complex question. So the first part is we don't know how much of autism is, is just having a personality and a co-occurring disability. Right. So if it's just those things and we were able to find ways to reduce the co-occurring disabilities, then you would have less autism and more Babco. That's that's a great outcome. If what we're seeing is an, an ever increasing intensification of traits. Then that's a that's a question. And we really it's a question that we need to think about. But humans are interesting. We have fl what I call floppy headed babies. Right. They're born. They are born so underdeveloped, it's ridiculous. And how long does it take for them to even be able to stand on their own? Um, how long does it take for them to fend for themselves? Their extended developmental period is really long, but, but it's so long. The only reason why we have it is because it's, it's, look at what we're able to do with it. You know, we wouldn't have the civilizations we have without the abilities that we have. And, and it's all linked to this long developmental period that they have. Well, you know, it's possible that some things that we see disabilities in may actually also be coupled, you know, with a mirror sided set of abilities. So if we, you know, if we we're all disabled in terms of flying, right, we, we use airplanes, to, to, to kind of compensate for our flying disabilities, right? And we use cars to, to compensate for the fact that we can't run very fast. And it may be that we just become, it, it's like a, you know, what is it? Kind of an ever escalating uh, technological, we change physiologically, we have to um, change technologically. We wear clothes, I don't have fur anymore, you know? So it may be that this is an ever, um, and, it, you know, this is an ongoing treadmill, perhaps. Great. All right. So since we're out of questions, I'll let you end with, if you had more time, money, and focus, what would the next layer of research be that you want to pursue? Right. And how do people reach out to you if they want to help facilitate That's, that? that that's fantastic. So I have a couple. I have I have a couple pitches and a soapbox. Um, so the couple pitches is um, number one. Um, we need. Um, we need to create a scale and we need to be able to start employing that scale and, and really getting a sense of what these strengths are. Um, I'm not the only researcher looking at strengths. Um, uh, Dr. Laurent Motron is looking at um, in, uh, enhanced um, perceptual reasoning. Um, Dr. Simon Baron Cohen, he, he, uh, he's been talking about systemizing for a long time. I think I've taken systemizing and split it up into more pieces. Um, but we really need to be looking at strengths. We need to look at neutral development, um, development in autisms, 
from a neutral standpoint, because we need to understand what is the natural timing so we can be working with development instead of against development. So that's, we need to do that. We also need to work more on self-determination. Um, adults are leaving high school and there's nothing. Um, many, if they're 12, and, you know, and they're 18, um, they need something in between. They're not quite ready for work. They're not quite ready for college and they're left with nothing. And I really think that self-determination programs, um, we created something here at Vanderbilt called Spectrum Pathways that I, you know, I personally think is out of this world. It's very flexible. It teaches um, self-regulation through mindfulness, um, goal setting, and it really meets the individual right where they're at so that they leave high school, but they're still working on things. They're still developing and growing and it, it has some structure to it. So I think things like that are really important. The other thing that we need is health related research in autism. And the NIH right now, the way that it is structured, it includes autism as part of its research priorities, but the focus is mostly about how to, um, you know, is in cause, cure and prevention of autism and in the treatment of autism, but there's virtually nothing for health-related issues in autism. There's no research for it, and you can't apply for it in the different institutes. So if I go over to the institute that specializes in sleep, they tell me to go over to the NIMH, where they specialize in autism, and NIMH says we don't do sleep. We don't do cardiovascular disease. We don't do all of these other conditions that we know are occurring at a high rate in autism. And so we have a problem, no, you know, where this, this funding is being blocked. No one's trying to do it. It's just how the funding priorities are structured. And if 85% or more of these individuals have health conditions, um, we, we, really need to have, um, we really need to have some research in that area. Things like cognitive behavioral therapy for insomnia can deal with sleep issues. We know that 80 to 85% of individuals have sleep issues. And if we were able to adapt that therapy for individuals on the spectrum for their different kinds of Babco personalities so that it's motivating for them, we might be able to address their sleep. But right now, I don't have a funding institute to be able to do that kind of research to get the funding for it. So I just want to throw that plug out there. All right. Well, hopefully folks who are listening and can help find the resources, whether it's personally or through their network, to help you get that done. Really appreciate your time tonight. I really appreciate the attention of all the folks who joined us. And again, this is being recorded, so hopefully we can get this posted and you can find it on YouTube and watch it in your community and share it with your friends. Dr. McDonald, thanks so much for your time tonight. Thank you so much. It was an honor.